Hi everyone, this is your host, Beth. Before we start this episode, I just wanted to warn you that it contains some descriptions of sexual abuse against children. Listener discretion is advised. The breakdown of any relationship is a painful and messy business, especially when there are children involved. But when Francis Walsh divorced his wife in 1987, he could never have imagined the nightmare that lay ahead. This is the Case Remains podcast, episode 14, The Disappearance of Therese van der Heiden Walsh. Francis Walsh, known as Fran, was an army major stationed in Fort Meade, Maryland, when he first met Merle van der Heiden in November of 1979. Mel was a lieutenant and they were both assigned to military intelligence units. Mel was mostly doing admin work, but she was wildly intelligent, with a master's in psychology and trained in counterintelligence analysis and documentation. Fran was recently divorced after a 10-year marriage and was quickly drawn to this smart and capable woman. He asked Mel out on a date and she said yes. Later, when their romance was nothing but a strange and distant memory, Fran would say that Mel was a rebound, that he was probably feeling lonely after the breakdown of his marriage. Nevertheless, Fran and Mel were married less than a year later, with a ceremony at the base chapel. Mel left the army in May of 1982, and two years later their daughter was born. They named her Therese Rose van der Heiden Walsh. Unfortunately, though, their marriage wasn't a happy one, and after Teresa's birth, things only got worse, the strain between them growing heavier with each day. By that time, the family were living in Hawaii, where Fran had been transferred when Therese was one year old. At one point, their arguments got so bad that Fran moved out of the family home and lived in his car for four months. By May of 1987, Their almost seven-year marriage had completely fallen apart, and finally they separated for good. Not long after, Fran met someone new, a woman named Janice, who would later go on to marry. On their first date, Mel turned up and began screaming at the new couple. Fran took Mel aside to talk while Janice waited in his car. Suddenly, Mel got into the car and attacked Janice with a stun gun. Luckily, the voltage was so low that it didn't do any serious harm. That December, however, things turned even darker. Merle accused Fran of sexually abusing Therese, and an investigation was launched. However, no evidence could be found to back up Merle's claims. Merle had even hired a psychologist to provide a testimony against her soon-to-be ex-husband, a move that would end up completely backfiring. Rather than supporting Mel's claims of abuse, the psychologist testified that Therese was suffering from parental alienation syndrome, a term that had only recently been coined by child psychologist Dr. Richard Gardner. Parental alienation syndrome occurs when one parent turns a child against the other through negative comments, blame, and false accusations. In short, it's an extreme form of brainwashing. Together, the psychologist and social worker agreed that if Mel was to be granted custody of Therese, she would likely take off with her and never return. A grim prediction that would unfortunately end up coming true. At the end of the investigation, Fran was cleared of any wrongdoing and was granted sole custody of Therese. The family court judge, Francis Wong, noted that not only was Mel highly unpredictable, but that she had shown a flagrant disregard to her child's needs. Wong ordered Merle to undergo a psychiatric evaluation and forbade her from having unsupervised visitation with Therese until she'd done so. Needless to say, Merle didn't take the news well. When Therese arrived at Fran's home, Janice said that her mother had cut out chunks of her hair. Merle fought the custody ruling, filing 136 pleadings and launching two separate appeals, which were both subsequently denied. She fired her attorneys and decided to represent herself. After the second appeal was denied, she took it to the US District Court, where a hearing was scheduled for July of 1990. But the day after their divorce was finalised, 
Mel left Hawaii for the mainland, leaving Therese with a parting gift. A Barbie doll with her telephone number and the words Call Collect scrawled on her rear end. Fran put his daughter into therapy, enrolled her in school and generally tried to instill a sense of normality for the little girl. Although he was understandably guarded, reluctant to let Therese anywhere without him. After all, Mel had taken off with Therese before. It was Christmas Day and Fran had turned up at Mel's house on Coapa Isle to give his daughter her gifts. But when he turned up, his estranged wife and Therese were nowhere to be seen. Mel had decided to take Therese on an unscheduled trip to mainland US. Once the divorce was finalised, however, Mel had kept her distance, keeping in touch with Therese with regular phone calls to Hawaii. The calls were scheduled twice a week, with both Mel and Fran recording them. Fran settled into his new family life with Therese, his then fiance Janice and her two children, hoping that he could finally put this nightmare behind him. Unfortunately for him, however, the nightmare was only just beginning. It was June 22nd, 1990, when Fran's life changed forever. That morning, he watched as his daughter skipped into summer camp, her hair in pigtails, dressed in tennis shoes and shorts. She was just days away from her sixth birthday. Fran had provided Teresa's summer camp with documentation, showing that he had been awarded sole custody of his daughter and that Mel had been ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation before being able to see Therese unsupervised, something which she had failed to do. With the documentation was a letter informing the camp that any attempt by Mel to contact her daughter, either on the phone or in person, had to be denied, and that both he and his attorney had to be notified in such an event. But at 12pm, Fran got the call. Therese had disappeared. He knew instantly that Mel was behind it. Sure enough, a witness had seen a woman resembling Fran's ex-wife, crudely disguised with a wig, dark glasses and a floppy hat, leading Therese away from the camp. Several other witnesses reported seeing them drive off in Mel's car. There had been a group of about 40 to 50 children outside at the time of Therese's disappearance, all making their way from the playground to a classroom inside. Adult counsellors were stationed at both the beginning and the end of the line. According to Teresa's partner in the group, a woman had come up to Teresa and whispered in her ear before leading her away. Friends and family flew into action, racing to the airport and scanning the crowds for Mel and Teresa until about 1.30 the following morning. Sadly, though, they were nowhere to be found. Sensing that tracking down Mel would be anything but straightforward, Fran immediately enlisted the help of a private investigator while police made their own attempts to locate Mel and Therese. The private investigator was based in Texas, as were a large number of Mel's family members, who Fran believed may have helped her disappear. In April of 1990, just a couple of months prior to her disappearance, Mel's social security number had been registered under her own name in Nederland, a Texas city where some of her relatives were living. After running Mel's social security number through a national database, however, the results pointed the private investigator towards a woman in Colorado Springs, where Mel also had family, including her sister, Mary Kim. Another lead pointed the investigator to a different woman in Colorado in October of 1991, a year after Mel and Therese vanished. Unfortunately, the Colorado leads later turned out to be a dead end. The investigator dismissed one as a false lead, while the FBI determined the other one to be linked to some kind of welfare scam. Mel's social security number alone sent the investigator and the authorities in different directions, confusing the investigation right from the start. As well as being registered in Texas and Colorado, it was also flagged in Mesa City, Arizona. It was listed under the name Pat Doherty back in December of 1989. Concerned that Mel's family may have been helping her, Fran decided to take matters into his own hands. On Teresa's seventh birthday, he and his brother-in-law, who was a retired policeman, conducted a stakeout opposite Mel's family home in Texas, waiting in case she and Therese turned up to celebrate the occasion. 
Once they were spotted, however, Neighbourhood Watch chased them away, Mel's brothers following them to the local 7-Eleven, where they had no choice but to leave. According to Fran, he also received information that Mel had purchased a death certificate in Salt Lake City, that of a child from Huntsville, Alabama. He believes that she may have used her unique skills that she learned in the military to turn the information from the death certificate into a birth certificate, obtain a social security number and create herself a brand new identity. When the private investigator headed to Colorado to check out the links to Mel's social security number, he also decided to keep watch on her sister, Mary Kim. Mary Kim was a school principal and is believed by some to have helped her sister run away. He spent one evening sat next to her at a school football game, listening in on her conversations in case she gave something away. The following day, he also knocked on her door, telling her that he was lost and needed directions. He peered into her house to look for children's toys or any kind of sign that a child could be living there, but he didn't see anything suspicious. Mary Kim would later say that she and her family had been continually harassed by Fran. Over in Texas, a police detective and an employee at the bank linked Mel's family to the purchase of a Ford van in 1990, which was then registered in Daytona Beach, Florida. The owner of the van was listed as Mary Jean Ham, but when police got a hold of her driving license information, the photo was of Merle, disguised in a wig and a pair of glasses. Police investigated the address that it was registered to, but it soon transpired that if Mel had ever been living there, she certainly wasn't anymore. Neither she nor the van were anywhere to be found. The mysterious Ford van had been registered at the National Crime Information Centre, who were alerted when it was sold by Mary Jean Ham four years later. The new owner was none other than Mel's sister-in-law, living in Bridge City, Texas. A local policeman went over to her house to check it out, but didn't have a search warrant to go take a look around. When FBI agents inspected the van a few days later, it had been completely wiped clean, No fingerprints, no nothing. By this point, the investigation had taken them across four different states, yet they were still no closer to finding Merle and Therese. This new information did seem to suggest, however, that perhaps Merle's family had been helping her. Her parents, Merle and Dorothy, were aware that people had their suspicions and said that they thought their phone had been tapped but they insisted that they'd had nothing to do with it. Speaking to the press in 1996, her father said, We hope she is okay, but if she is on the run, more power to her. Her mother Dorothy added, It is horrible, but it is better than if we knew Fran had her still. He is not a sane man. In autumn of 1995, the authorities had another lead that pointed them back to Colorado. They had reason to believe that Mel was living there when they discovered a Marie A. Vanderheiden was scheduled to speak at an American Bar Association conference in Denver. Staff at the Hawaii Clearinghouse for Missing Children got a hold of the license and identification photo for Marie to compare them and became convinced that Marie and Mel were in fact the same person. Police had an officer sat on the plane primed and ready to head over to Denver to make a positive identification in person. But at the last minute, the trip was called off. The Denver FBI compared the fingerprints, and they were not a match. Later, after the conference had been and gone, they realised that they had made a mistake. They had used Teresa's fingerprints instead of her mother's. Regardless, a follow-up check cleared the woman, who simply had an uncanny resemblance to Mel van der Heiden. It has never been proven either way as to whether Mel had any outside assistance to the kidnapping and disappearance. If she did go it alone, though, she was certainly better equipped to do so than most. Mel's military background, plus her education in psychology, meant that she had a wide range of skills that could have helped her evade the law. Specially trained in counterintelligence, it is believed that Mel could not only elude trackers with ease, but also frequently change her identity. It wasn't just her family that police suspected, however. Some believe that Mel also received guidance from an underground Atlanta group 
specialising in creating new identities. That group was called Children of the Underground. Run by a woman named Faye Yeager, the group aimed to protect children who were being abused via secret networks that allow the children and parent, usually their mother, to disappear. Yeager, who started life in rural West Virginia, began the group in 1987, after her own daughter was sexually abused by her first husband. Jaeger had walked in on him in the kitchen with their then two-year-old child. In retaliation, he had her committed to a psychiatric hospital, where she was put on medication and subjected to numerous shock treatments. Tests would later show that the little girl had contracted gonorrhea, but despite the medical evidence of the abuse, the girl's father was granted full custody. In a desperate attempt to keep her daughter away from him, Jaeger ran away with her daughter to South Carolina, for which she was promptly thrown in jail. Her daughter was returned to her father, and for more than a decade she kept quiet about the abuse, until 1986 when she called Jaeger for help after running away from home. Jaeger's ex-husband went on to become the first child molester on the FBI's Ted Most Wanted list, and was estimated to have abused up to 60 victims. He was eventually arrested for the abuse of three children in his local area, and in 1990 he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was released in 2006, and is currently living in Florida under court-ordered community supervision. By the time her ex-husband was caught, Jaeger had remarried twice, had four more children, and been running Children of the Underground for three years. Supported by her third husband's income as a paediatrician, she had formed safe houses in all 50 states, and even some overseas. But with a network operating on such a huge scale, it was inevitable that Jaeger would at some point run into trouble. She went to trial in 1992, where she was accused of kidnapping, interference with custody, and causing cruel and excessive mental pain to two of the children that she claimed to be helping. Myra Watts, a waitress from Florida, said that she'd approached Jaeger after leaving an abusive husband, but that Jaeger had then kidnapped her daughter Alicia and son Jared, aged 8 and 10 at the time. She alleged that Jaeger had kept Alicia from her for five days, only returning her to her mother after Myra had contacted the police. Myra also accused Faye of taking Jared from a shopping mall car park, returning him half an hour later. The children testified that they were scared of Jaeger and that she had forced them to fabricate stories that their father had sexually abused them and worshipped the devil. She told them that if they didn't cooperate, she would take them back to their father and they would never see their mother again. In fact, Jaeger had videotaped her interview with Alicia. In it, eight-year-old Alicia sits in Jaeger's home, clutching a Bible, while Jaeger asks her questions for hours. You don't know very much, do you? You gonna tell me what happened to you? If you don't tell me the truth, you're going to be hurt. Of the charges, which carried a maximum sentence of 60 years in prison, Jaeger was surprisingly nonchalant. If you're a whistleblower, you have to expect this, she said. Look what happened to Martin Luther King. It was a strange case, for sure but some of Jaeger's claims were even stranger. According to Watts, she had told her that her children were involved in witchcraft and practiced satanic rituals over her bed while she slept. Not only that, but they were also poisoning her with cyanide. Jaeger did appear to have a preoccupation with Satanism, stating that up to 70% of the cases she dealt with involved satanic ritual abuse. But opinions in court were divided. Duff Ortman, an air traffic controller from Kentucky, spoke at Jaeger's trial. He hadn't seen his son for three years. He said, She's had a tragedy in her own life, and I think because of that she sees ghosts behind every tree now. For me, she's a nightmare, and for my son she's a nightmare. What Mrs Jaeger either doesn't understand or doesn't care about is that she's damaging these children because she's brainwashing them into believing that fantasy is reality and reality is fantasy. My desperation is to salvage what's left of my son's childhood. But for another woman at court, 
Jaeger had been the answer to her prayers. Jaeger had helped her daughter and grandchildren to run away from their father, who had allegedly been using the children to create homemade videos of abuse. The courts could never protect them, she said. For the two years they've been gone, they've been protected in a way that they weren't before. But even when children were recovered from children of the underground, often the damage had already been done. Nine-year-old Zachary Smith and his six-year-old sister Chelsea were kidnapped from California in 1997 with the help of the group. Their mother Elizabeth had made numerous accusations of abuse against their father Michael, though they were all found to be baseless by police. Much like Merle, Elizabeth had recently lost custody of the couple's two children. It wasn't until 13 years later that Zachary and Elizabeth were eventually found, but they told the FBI that they wanted nothing to do with their father. In 2010, Michael made a video that he posted to YouTube, hoping that his children might listen to it and one day change their minds. Well, Zach, Chelsea, I'm going to speak to the two of you. I found out about five days ago on Wednesday, November, I believe it was the 13th, that the FBI had finally found the two of you. Zachary, I know that you had come forward about seven weeks ago. Chelsea, um, you were found about a week ago. You have both indicated that you don't want to see me or have any contact with me. Based on what you've gone through in the 13 years, I wouldn't expect anything more than that. I, I believe I understand not knowing what you had gone through. I want you to know that this entire time since December 19th, 1997, I have loved you. I have never stopped thinking about you. I think about you daily and I miss you on a daily basis. That is from the heart. I now reach out to you in this form of video as one last attempt to try and make contact with you. Um, we still live in Walnut Creek. I married Trey short, uh, about a year after you guys uh, went missing. And so uh, I want to let you know what what my thoughts are and what, I, what I've come to know. Prior to your mom taking you through the Children of the Underground, Faye Yeager's group in December of 97, up until that time, there were 13 allegations of abuse, sexual, physical, verbal abuse, leveled by your mother against me. There were five different police departments involved, Piedmont Police, Walnut Creek, Pleasant Hill, Concord, and Antioch Police Departments. There were countless uh, court cases, court hearings. There were two full, complete evaluations. In the month of November and December of 1997, I was beginning to um, seek full, complete legal and physical custody, custody of the two of you. I've been advised to do so by therapists and by counselors and also by the court. Uh, the day that you were, the day I found out that you had been abducted, December 19th, 1997, you had already gone through Atlanta's Children of the Underground. Uh, I do not harbor any ill will towards you for not wanting to contact me. You are as much a victim of this circumstance as I. I have no idea what the two of you have been through for the past 13 years. My mind has gone crazy and wild ever since the December 19th, 1997 as to where you may have been anywhere in the world, what you have gone through, who or what you've experienced. I have no idea. Just my imagination has run rampant. My hope and prayer right now is that maybe seeing this video that you'll, you'll start feeling that, you know what, maybe this guy who you may have been told uh, is a bad guy isn't necessarily such a bad guy. I don't need to defend myself because I know I am a man of God and I know who I am. I know what I represent. Zachary, I understand and I believe, I have not been told, but I believe that the FBI didn't find you, but you found the FBI. That would be my son who would step forward. That would be the man that I would hope that you would have grown up to be. And I believe that through that word that Chelsea too followed that same path. I don't know what more to say other than, again, that I love you, I miss you, and I want to see you. God bless. On the 14th of May, 1992, Jaeger was found not guilty of the kidnapping and emotional abuse of children. 
she vowed to carry on with, as she saw it, safeguarding children from abuse. But children of the underground wouldn't see out the decade. Faced with a couple of multi-million dollar lawsuits, Jaeger closed the group down in the late 90s, before moving to South Carolina with her husband and opening a bed and breakfast. The families mentioned here provide a mere snapshot into the number of people affected by children of the underground. By the time of the group's eventual collapse, Jaeger estimated that she had helped 1,000 families go into hiding. And so, along with hundreds of others, Fran was left in the dark about what, if any, assistance Jaeger had provided to his ex-wife. As the years passed, it became harder and harder to keep Therese in the public eye and generate interest in the search. In 1996, an age-progressed photo of the then 12-year-old Therese was released to the public. The photo was included on direct mail advertising and distributed to over 61 million households across the United States. But still, there was nothing. In 1993, the day camp where Teresa had been kidnapped were found partially liable for her disappearance. A circuit jury decided that they were 10% liable, as was Fran, with the remaining 80% going to Merle. With Merle out of the picture, however, Hawaii law stated that the camp had to pay her share of the compensation. Though the total amount of damages is unclear, Fran's attorney put it in the region of $400,000. Fran used the money to help fund his search for Therese, working closely with his private investigator for a number of years and continuing to chase leads all across mainland America. He kept Therese's stuffed toys and drawings and for a while kept her room exactly as she had left it, reluctantly redecorating after several years had passed. He didn't like to go anywhere that there may be children, the reminder of his little girl far too painful to bear. But his search for Therese wouldn't carry on for much longer. It was the night of the 6th of September 1998 when Fran complained of a pain in his chest. He took a hot shower and a strong dose of heartburn medication, telling his wife that he was feeling much better. He went to bed, hair still wet, and fell asleep in Janice's arms. But sadly, Fran would never wake up. In the early hours of the morning, he passed away after suffering a heart attack in his sleep. Fran was aged just 53 years old. It's now been almost three decades since Mel van der Heiden plucked her daughter from her day-to-day life, leading her through the shadows into a life on the run. Somewhere out there, there's a 35-year-old woman maybe one with children of her own. Who's to say whether in some distant memory she sees the face of a loving father calling her Therese? Thank you for listening to episode 14 of the Case Remains podcast. You can keep in touch over on Twitter and Instagram with the handle Case Remains and you can also check out our website at www.caseremains.com where you'll find write-ups on missing persons cases and unsolved mysteries. If you haven't done so already, I also highly recommend checking out Morbidology, a brand new podcast from talented true crime writer Emily G. Thompson. Until next time, stay safe. <laughs>